You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community and forum, and the Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from fresh farm ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Good morning and hello, kids. Welcome to season three and episode number 67 of the Daily Beaver here on the Cryer Media Network. Uh, Today, recording day is Wednesday, March 1st, 2023. Yes, kitties, spring is on the way. Spring is on the way. And it will be a mild day here at the Beaver Lodge with some wet snow this afternoon. In fact, it's going to be a mild week here at the Beaver Lodge with temperatures at uh, zero or above as a high all week, except for like one week from now, and that can change. So, right? It's like that, uh, what was it? It was that uh, this hour's 22 minutes thing where we're going to tell you the weather in like two weeks. <laughs> it's going to be plus two. Plus, plus <laughs> two. Always plus two. <laughs> I'm your host, the Eager Reaver pronoun. Plus e. two, but uh, it never really is. Yes. Oh, something just happened to your volume. Uh, I'm your host, the Eager Beaver, pronouns he, him, he, Mr. Beaver A, and with me, as always, is my dear friend, Mr. Grizzly, uh, doing his uh, guerrilla podcasting uh, thing from within the closet, where uh, he has gone deep undercover trying to find Skippy. To say. No luck so far. Yeah, we do the extra work, though. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll check every closet. We haven't we haven't got access to Harper's Broom Closet yet, but we're working on it. We're working on it. Of course, a big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss Bee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Uh, today we have a Wednesday morning, I'm guessing potentially a bite, given that we sort of have more time with this kind of setup, but we'll see where we go. Um, but before we start... Mr. Grizzly, good morning, and how's your mental health today? Well, good morning, Mr. Beaver. Um, I, I'm not awake, so <laughs> I don't know how I'm feeling. <laughs> I had a I had a I had a moment last night where I was like, "Life sucks. Everything is terrible. This world is horrible. I'm in complete despair." You know, one of those things. That old mm. chestnut, and and then okay, I'm going to bed. I woke up this morning, groggy as can be. I'm still groggy. I'm here at seven a.m. as they requested, um, and there's no one here yet. <laughs> so Ooh. I'm alone in a closet with no coffee. Mm. 
<laughs> That's peanuts. <laughs> oh, Water. Oh, no coffee. Healus, Mr. Grizzly. Ooh, with not enough sleep, I'm in a closet. It's going to be an interesting show. Danger pay. <laughs> I can't chill him. <laughs> danger. <laughs> He's getting danger pay. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's part, hey, of, it's, it's hey. part of the True North Eager Beaver Incorporated corporate company benefits. We mm-hmm. have no assets. <laughs> I agree, Sauce. No, <laughs> Saucy. No, no, no. That's not a proper way to treat a grizzly. <laughs> I brought it, as you can tell, I, I brought a, another camera, but I should have brought maybe a light fixture because I'm, I'm rather dark in here. It didn't occur to me. But oh, well. Oh, well. It's gorilla I, style, so, you know. Yep, yeah, there we go. I just fixed my light there. Ah, and then another one, yes, uh, from Kit Saucy again, Harper's Closet is probably very scary and full of skeletons. I guess that's why it's taken time. We have to dig them all up and look under them because, you know, when men lose something, mm. it's always under something else, right? <laughs> Whenever I can't find anything, I, pay, I, I imagine my mom, I hear my mom in my head go, men never lift anything up. And then I lift something up and there it is. And sometimes the thing I lift up is myself and I'm, it turns out I'm sitting on it. So, <laughs> oh, oh, man. Uh, oh, Kit Linda. Oh, you think you've got assets. Oh, okay. Starting with the double on ent- double entendre early today. Oh, um, and uh, Kit Jillian, uh, I'm not sure if I did see your beaver video that you sent me. Uh, I'll, however, I did see this one uh, the other day that someone sent to me, uh, Mr. Grizzly. If you will, this is uh, yours, yours truly. Very, very hard at work. Mm. Having a good lunch. Yep. That was uh, me leaving those. Uh, we, we were joking in the chat before you arrived about leaving a trail of wood chips to be able to find you. <laughs> so uh, that was me doing my duty. <laughs> well, my, my laptop, this is the same laptop we use for the podcast. And for some reason, it was frozen solid this morning. So I had to uh, shut down a bunch of things manually to get up and running. Gorilla style, right? There's going to be glitches. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, Kid Jillian says that is the one that she said. Okay, good. And then says our video is much better. Than, my wood video is much better than Skippy. Well, this is true. This is true. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, shit, oh where's my loony when I need it? Uh, <laughs> oh, man. We are bad today. Bad kits. Bad kits. And I totally approve. Come sit next to me. All right, Mr. Grizzly, do you have anything to start us off with today? Uh, no, unfortunately, I don't because I, I, I was so busy trying to get this thing to work this morning that I didn't have a chance to load in any assets, unfortunately. Although I did something we did talk about last week. I have mm-hmm. two clips here. Uh, remember how I was talking about how Abila, Abila CBT, mm-hmm. uh, remember that Abila CBT is like other benefits. You pay for the program up front and you can get reimbursed through your benefits or insurance plan under your paramedical coverage or through your healthcare spending account. I don't know what the hell that is. Anxiety is your body's response to danger. The danger can be real. You might only think it is real. Usually anxiety doesn't come from a real danger. Instead, it comes from worrying about what might happen. And I'm going to get anxiety because it's $400 for this treatment from shoppers mm. drug how to reduce anxiety by learning cognitive behavioral therapy skills use cbt skills to change your responses to anxiety trigger triggers develop strategies to track and reduce your anxiety response get started today for hundred dollars <laughs> well i have anxiety about that because that extra four hundred dollars is not in my budget i don't have it so Yep. Yeah. These are, um, the way they're getting around it with the loophole, as we mentioned in a previous show, is that these are uh, services that are not performed by healthcare professionals that are covered Correct. under the provincial health plan. So they're increasing the number of points of access to some type of health service, but 
they're all outside of what is listed as the coverage uh, in the mm-hmm. provincial plans. And unless the governments are having an inclination to recognize that the world has changed and that we need various service points supplied by various people because we just don't have enough bodies to provide the services. So we have yeah. to give people different authorities and permissions and power. Um, that doesn't mean leave them uncovered. Because if we're talking about the principles of the Canada Health Act, this is the thing that a lot of people don't misunderstand about the Canada Health Act. A lot of people think that it forbids private. No, it doesn't. Delivery. It doesn't at all. It doesn't at all. There's absolutely nothing in the Canada Health Act that forbids private delivery. It's that there are the, the five principles, the portability, universality, all that type of stuff that we keep on talking with regard to the Canada Health Act. Those are the principles that have to be maintained. And that's what uh, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, is saying when he talks about that. And that's why a lot of people were surprised uh, that he considered Doug Ford's plans to be innovation, because so long as they are indeed fully covered, by the mm-hmm. provincial plan, it doesn't matter. There's nothing about the Canada Health Act that talks about that it has to be absolutely public delivery, that we have to have a public health care system. It just has to be covered in terms of access, portability, universality, and all that kind of stuff. So the plans, as they are written, are conform with the Canada Health mm-hmm. Act. However, if they keep on expanding service provision to providers that are not covered by the provincial plans, at some point, somebody might take that to court and ask, is this respectful of the Canada Health Act? So, for example, when we were talking about the lens, you know, where you can get your basic lens and then you get your upsell, well, who says that nobody all decides that the basic lens is pretty much of such low quality that everybody needs going to need to buy the upgraded lens anyway. Right. Yeah. What is that minimal standard that's for acceptable for everyone? Then there needs to be regulation about those types of things. And that's where we're going to start to meet a lot of problems with this because a lot of this is action for action's sake. Right. When we were seeing oh, Doug yes. Ford go to all those new places that they had built with all the shiny equipment, but, nobody there to actually provide the service right that's action for action's sake i guess because you get the press release look we're doing something we're spending unprecedented amounts like this and you're saying but it's not yielding any real result because unless there's a body there to provide the service you can have all the places to access the service you want you're still not getting it this is true right so yeah you have to be a this is um it's a big no man's land at the moment and the premiers basically have the advantage at the moment to create all these new things and then only for us to find out you know one or two years down the road that oh no it's not conform and to the canada health act and then we of course we have to bring that through court and have all that process so they're just they're doing it is easier to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission at this moment yeah beg for uh, beg for uh, forgiveness instead of asking for permission. Right. Not to mention the fact that when you see when you see on some of those websites that particular national drugstore brand, they have mm-hmm. the ability for you can talk to a doctor right away for sixty nine dollars. Talk to a doctor out of province. Yeah. That is actually a loophole. How they get around making you pay for what should be covered under universal okay. care. Uh, and then they're like, if you want, you can pay $30 a month as a member to get all the coverage you want, see, and yeah. talk to a doctor at any time. You don't get to see them because they're out of province. Mm-hmm. It's it's how they work around it. Yep. Yep. So, yep, there's going to be lots of... I'm going to have to jump in and out frequently today. I apologize in advance. I forgot to, forgot to give that precursor. I'm going to have to jump in and out frequently because I am at... Uh, at the office and I do have to help out with some stuff. So if you see me disappear, don't panic. I'll be back. Just letting everybody know. Mm-hmm. Your mic is particularly good in catching the people yeah. behind you to speaking or in the other room or outside. Yeah. Um, I can adjust it, but then can you hear me now? It's, it's really yeah. low right now. Right? I can hear you. It's still good? Yep. Yeah. Can yep. the kids hear me? Because I, I turned it. It's a digital. It goes from 10 to 9 and the difference is like from off to on almost. <laughs> hmm. 
Okay, kids, uh, if you can on the chat, let us know how uh, Mr. Grizzly is sounding volume wise. That would be we'd be appreciate we'd be very appreciative. Thank you very much. We can hear. We okay, can hear sounds good. All right, perfect. Okay, good. Good to know. Yep. So yeah, uh, this is a. There's got to be a lot of uh, moving fast and breaking things. Yes. Uh, on the part of the premiers, and uh, I guess a lot of them are hoping that they can break them so good that they can't be put back together <laughs> very quickly. Uh, so we'll see where this goes, but uh, it's mm -hmm. oh yeah the, the thin the thin edge of the wedge is in. That's definitely Very clear. Much so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see what else. Oh yes, people are telling you to grab some coffee, Mister Grizzly. <laughs> um, uh, I believe they've just brought some, so I'll be back in just a moment. Oh, okay. That sounds. <laughs> and there he goes. Um. Yeah. So that's. Let's see. What else can we have? I had some extra health information here somewhere for you uh, about the health deals so far. Um, Alberta was the seventh and the latest to sign on. It will get an extra $24 billion over the next 10 years, including $3 billion for a bilateral agreement that is focused on shared priorities. Um, I was actually quite surprised uh, that Alberta fell in line so damn quickly. Now I know they had their budget uh, to present yesterday and I guess they wanted the numbers finalized because they are going into an election in May and well, I mean if we're talking about the real politic of the situation Danielle Smith doesn't really have the time for the healthcare battle right now uh, with the Prime Minister uh, because I mean She's trying to prepare an election, and it seems that uh, it is close that the NDP and the UCP are basically statistically tied in the polls. So the margin that the NDP had opened up a few months ago seems to have closed again, uh, which, of course, makes me nervous <laughs> because I was really, 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 really hoping that they had just done so much terrible stuff and that she was just such a disaster and so unacceptable that uh well not that it would be a cakewalk because i mean you know it is alberta after all and well okay yeah. and you've been voting the same way pretty much exclusively for 50 something years it's hard to get people to stop but it looks like uh, we are actually going to have a race unless uh, Danielle Smith is as much of a walking disaster in the campaign as she was uh, in her first few weeks after winning the leadership. So it does seem that it is a closer race than we had hoped it would be, unfortunately. Uh, now, when uh, the money came in, um, she said the same thing uh, that pretty much all the premiers have been saying. I think that big meeting they all had together was to agree on what their first line of their statements would be, which is, well, the final proposal is far less than what the premiers of the provinces and territories were requesting. Well, yeah, you were asking for $28 billion infusion in just one year, plus the escalator, plus the, <laughs> the money to help with backlogs, plus, plus, plus like, come on. <laughs> that was that was a little big of a, a little bit of a big of an ask, especially in an environment where all your federal conservative colleagues are saying that every time the government spends a penny, they're contributing to rising inflation. <laughs> you know, and it's like cut spending, cut spending, but you know, you got to give the provinces twenty eight billion dollars for health. You know, and it's like, but every spending you do is inflationary, except for that twenty eight billion dollars for health. And the message on the conservative side is completely messed up with regard to the fiscal responsibility side of the message. Um, so, you know, and federally, the conservatives are not advantaged on this issue by the fact that. I think six or seven of our provinces have conservative provincial governments because if they need to raise a tax for something or if they need uh, you know, to put a cash infusion of spending like those $500 checks that many provinces put out to, to give out to people, you know, all of that was also inflationary spending. Right. So it doesn't matter what you spend. Well, 
I mean, it doesn't matter. It does matter what you spend it on. The more you spend it on people who will absolutely need, if you were spending it only on the people who absolutely needed it, you would be doing the actual strategic minimum to keep your economy going and not fall off a cliff during a situation like this. But they basically gave $500 checks to anybody who can file an income tax return. So that's not exactly, uh, you know, what you, if somebody was making the prescription of what you needed to get inflation back down to 2% as fast as possible, a lot of those provincial premiers, conservative provincial premiers, did not cooperate, did not row in the same direction as the rest of the team on that front. And the federal conservatives said absolutely nothing. Said absolutely nothing about that free cash. So, you know, the, the positions are very, 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 very inconsistent, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, both of them uh, presented their oh. budgets. Uh, that's a happy Mr. Grizzly. <laughs> I have coffee. Coffee's um, good. Coffee's good? All right. Um, so, yes, uh, two presented their budgets. I had extra uh, data on um, money and cash amounts for Ontario and Atlantic Canada. For some reason, uh, they have completely and totally disappeared. Uh, I don't know. So the sometimes I don't know what it is when I take notes. Sometimes they don't save, and I don't know why that is, and they just vanish. Uh, I but know. I had them. Yeah, I had them yesterday and today, and I put them in a separate file, all the health information together, so I could have it all in one spot. And the cut and paste did not happen, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, uh, unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have that data. But uh, the four Atlantic provinces uh, got amounts uh, varying, I think, between two hundred and twenty-eight million dollars uh, from the, uh, which was uh, Prince Edward Island, up to a billion, which I'm guessing is uh, Nova Scotia, given that they're most populous. Um, One and billion dollars. <laughs> uh, and then Ontario, of course, got the bulk of the funding. I think they got to twenty-four billion, I believe. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, I'll, uh, th that's going from memory. So I don't have uh, all the exact numbers, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately for you. I will try to get them again. Um, so yeah, I'm a little disappointed that that happened. Um, so yes, both uh, provinces uh, tabled some budgets. Uh, I don't have a deep dive for you, of course, because <laughs> budgets are hard to go into especially when a lot of them are coming up uh, all at once so i'll be waiting for some analysis and you know coming back with a you know more informed position in over the coming days but uh, alberta basically is flush with cash because it has uh, stated that it has a 2.5 billion dollar surplus projected and this is from what the report seemed to be a very standard we're going into an election and we're buying we're shopping for votes budget <laughs> now uh, i did hear something and and you might be able to substantiate this but i did hear something to the effect that alberta was going to um uh, add to the heritage fund that they started back in the 80s that they stopped contributing to i don't know how many years ago many Are you yeah, like 20 years ago, they haven't contributed to it. More Something than like maybe that. 30? Yeah, they, they, had a, 30? Uh, they actually drew from it, too. Yes, yes. Well, and Norway is the richest country on Earth. Did you know that? Mm hmm They have their heritage fund, which they copied when they saw what Alberta did, is worth a few trillion. Trillion with a T. Yep. They do not touch it. They just continue to let it build and grow. Yep. And it's there for times like the pandemic, when businesses had to shut down. And guess what? They still didn't have to draw on it because they had enough uh, uh, money set aside to help everybody out. Mm -hmm. That's cut. That's what you call responsible government, my friends. Yep. Whereas in Alberta, as soon as they started having surpluses, they cut dividend checks to buy votes to anybody who just happened to have the good fortune of being living on top of oil at that time. They didn't do anything so for it. So stupid. No. It's like the oil is in the ground for like millions of years, <laughs> but mm -hmm. you happen to be living on top of it at the time we pulled it out of the ground and it was $140 a barrel, 120. So you get a check. You get, a check, and you get a check. It's like Oprah. For what yeah, though? For existing. 
yeah no that money was supposed to be there as as, as for rainy days instead yep. they just bought votes yep yeah. yep so uh no i haven't heard uh, about that one it wasn't uh, part of the big headlines but i will look for it because that would not surprise me because that would be a very populist vote getting move uh, of course they now they can only do that while the price of oil is great because alberta has shown in the past that it couldn't even turn a surplus when oil was running at 148 dollars a barrel yeah uh, I tell you, it's like Alberta is like the land of oil and they can't make a profit on oil. Doug Ford was a drug dealer. He can't turn it. He can't sell pot legally with, for profit. What is what it with he, these people? What did he lose? He lost, what, $40 million in yeah. the first year of legal cannabis, a former drug dealer. Come on. <laughs> Conservatives like, are fiscally responsible. They're not no, they're good not. money. They <laughs> never have been. They're drunken sailors. <laughs> oh, man. No Jeez. offense to drunken sailors. Yeah, no, 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 no. Drunken sailors can actually be a lot of fun. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm an, I'm I'm the one in the closet today too. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I've encountered one or two over my, over the course of my lifetime. <laughs> hey, sailor, go my way. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> why, why, why do okay? You know the old joke. Why why do why do members of your community like uh, like ships? Why? Full full of semen. <laughs> that's a good one right it's a good one it's not offensive <laughs> offensive oh some people find a way to be offensive but uh, I, I i'm the wrong gauge i have a totally totally like if you get me all alone and i know my audience and i know i'm safe i got a totally inappropriate yeah. sense of humor totally oh, dark yeah. and yeah. very very Time adult like this one well, you know, that, that one is just innuendo yeah that's just innuendo but people go, oh, you went for the easy joke, oh, yeah, gays and semen, nah, 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 like this. I mean, I used to go, like when I went to the Just for Lost Festival in Montreal. My, my, I always made sure I had a ticket for the nasty show, <laughs> the one that happened at eleven o'clock, where you say all the things. You know. So, my sense of humor is probably not the yard. It's probably not the normative yardstick. <laughs> so I have to watch myself every now and then. I have these ideas well, and these jokes I want to make, and it's like. Mm -hmm. Hey, maybe my audience is not going to consent to hearing that one, so I'm going to hold that one back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a couple, couple years ago, back when I was in a relationship, my then girlfriend, uh, my then partner, she wanted to go see Scott Thompson, who was hosting a show at Yuck Yucks on Elgin, which is now the uh, Skate Manor, Manor Lounge, sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, Scott Thompson was the host, and there was four other comedians, and it was the kickoff to Pride Week. And Scott Thompson was pretty tame compared to some of the other comedians. They got really dark, really vulgar, and I laughed hysterically. And I think I was the only non-gay man in the house. And and of course, you know, the, the couple sitting beside us were like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I came to see a comedy show. Scott Thompson, what are you talking about? And they were older. They were older than me, like by 10 or 15 years. So they were kind of like, you know, I'm like, am I allowed to be here? They're like, oh, of course, of course. I'm like, okay. Then, then I proceeded to laugh my guts out. And afterwards, I'm talking to the girlfriend at the time, and she was like, "Wow, some of that was pretty dark." I'm like, "What? What were you expecting?" Right? <laughs> Have you seen what, what we've been what? through? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, what were you expecting? She's like, "Yeah, I didn't know they were going to go that deep." I'm like, "I thought they were going to go deeper." Oh yeah, no, 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 no. Trust it. Our community, were it not for dark humor, we would not have survived. True. Yeah. It's true. The getting beaten up in the streets, the HIV AIDS pandemic. I, like, I tell yeah. you, you heard the best, worst jokes at a funeral in the early oh, 80s. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, no because, problem. you know, a lot of people were going to 30, 40 of them a year. Yeah. I mean, I've at been that, to 42 in the last 15 years, but you were, you were doing that many in. Anymore. Well, I, I wasn't because I wasn't in the age. No, of, no, no, no. I remember back in the you time, very, yeah. in, in 1989, yeah. I was 16, right? In the early right. before. So, but, but, you know, when you come out and, you know, mm -hmm. you basically, you basically are coming out into a, like a war zone. There's a wasteland. I mean, that AIDS quilt that they have mm -hmm. going around oh, the yeah. world. I saw that many, many years ago on the Washington Mall Plaza. They had to bring it to the Washington Mall Plaza to be able to put every Panel, fit. that yeah. was there it was the first time that the entire panel everything had been put and it was all over there mm -hmm. and that was what 
20 something close to 20 years ago now when oh, i did that so can you imagine the number of panels that are on now well that was before prior to proteus inhibitors and, and uh, around, around the time now. they came out yeah right around, yeah when, when right i when that. when i went to see the the the, the quilt uh which is, but it's 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 huge it is it, it was huge and that yeah. was 20, well, i've seen photos that was over 20 years ago oh, you yeah. needed the whole washington mall to be able to show it all in one spot at once and that's a big space yeah so yeah, uh, you know the there there are people in the gay community of a certain age who have absolutely nobody of their circle of friends. Yeah, no, when true. they were coming out, true. and and some of them haven't had them for like twenty years already. Yeah, right. So when you go yeah. to when you go to you know forty fifty funerals a year, and you know, so you, and you're seeing the same people all over again. Oh, okay, so you made it. Right? Okay, <laughs> and it's yeah. like, ooh, that's dark. It's like that was life. We needed that mm-hmm. to get through. It was oh, not yeah. a good time. That's why, you know, for the kids that have been here since you know earlier, uh, when we used to have uh, during the the worst uh, of the COVID uh, pandemic, when we did our opened up with our, the coast to coast to coast COVID update, uh, that was my motivation, mm-hmm. right? Because I've seen a pandemic up close. I had front row seat. It is not good. <laughs> you know, and pandemics almost always first attack the most socially vulnerable groups. So, of course, which was the case with HIV, right? Injection drug users, migrant workers, sex trade workers, uh, black people, gays, wherever it was in the world. Like I said, the pandemic was different in different countries, right? In Russia, it was injection drug users and mi- migrant uh, migrant workers that were the, the drivers of the pandemic. In Canada, you know, in North America, it started, the gay, the gay community is where it landed first. But everywhere where it landed first, it landed in the group of people that nobody cared about. And nobody yeah. did anything. It was allowed to grow and grow and grow and fester until it started crossing over. Right. It wasn't until HIV and AIDS started affecting good white people. Well, it was, I think, sort Ryan of White, the, that little kid. Yeah. Right. That's when people started to care. Right. When he decided when he was hemophiliac and he got a transplant, when he went to kindergarten, people, you know, for first aid, people were throwing rocks at him. Mm-hmm. That's when people finally. Well, didn't, uh, didn't uh, Paul Michael Glazer's wife also get something to a transfusion? Oh, Michael Glazer, uh, Starsky and Hutch fame. He was Possibly. Starsky. Yeah, I don't I know. I think his wife did, if memory serves. That's over 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, but and of I, course. One of the, I think the breakthrough point when it was, I think, publicly discussed amongst politicians, correct me if I'm wrong, was Rock Hudson. Rock Hudson, that's, that was, you get, that's exactly where I was going. Because, and that whole thing, that whole kiss with Linda Evans on Dynasty. So they found out, oh my God, is she an HIV? It's a damn kiss. It's, right? it's like the so, Eddie Murphy thing, right? Go home with that shit on your lips. No, that's not how it works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was another thing that's get a lot of people got really offended because of that. And it's like, I'm sitting there, it's like, uh, if, are you listening to that thing? Because he's mm-hmm. basically telling you how people are being so stupid. Yes. With regard to it, right? I it's think not, a lot of people. A lot of people it, missed it, I think. A lot of people missed it. So, but I'm sitting there and I'm going, uh, no, uh, that's not insulting, actually, at all. And, um, yeah, I actually have friends that have been in that situation where somebody said something really, really ignorant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, well, Rock Hudson was handsome. And also, you know, Rock Hudson, I mean, Rock Hudson Doris Day, right? The American. Well, he was the man, man's man's man, right? He was the macho dude he was yeah there. and she was the sweetheart Doris Day, dude. yeah no, so together they were to iconic so thing. yeah so one mm-hmm. that he was gay number one rocked a lot of worlds back then and then hiv positive on top of that yeah yeah no, no, back then it was a big day it, it was a big well, day it, I mean, it was thunderous news it was and i remember it like it was yesterday it, it, and of course it, it, those of you who remember watching Austin Powers in theater when he, because uh, it was 1997 when the first film came out and he's catching up on friends of mine who've died and he goes down the list and he goes, I can't believe Liberace was gay. Women loved him. 
<laughs> it is funny, right? Come, the realization, you know, like been gone for thirty years, come back, and like, oh my, oh my goodness, I had no idea. We, we had that in French in, in Quebec too. We had a, a guy I think named Michel Louvain. I don't know if he ever actually did fully come out. Um, but everybody always suspected for the longest time. And he was one of those like people that were really famous, like in the fifties and sixties and like this. So when you got later on, you have the, all the, all these little old ladies and, you know, he's 16, 70, he's still singing songs and they're all like, Oh, Michel. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> it didn't matter. It, was going. it didn't matter. <laughs> they just loved their Michel. <laughs> they just wanted to hear him sing. Did Johnny Mathis come out a couple of years ago after? I don't know. I don't did he? he ever, I, yeah, he did. I'm pretty Appreciate sure he did. It. I don't think he ever denied it, but I think he always avoided the question. And I think he finally came out a couple of years ago. You got to remember, he's of a generation where, you know. Oh, yeah. Same, same with George Takei from, from Sulu from Star Trek, the original series. You kept that hidden from everybody for fear of uh, a career reprisal in, in ways that we couldn't understand. I mean, that's all gone now today, thank goodness. People can live their, their lives as authentically as possible. Mm -hmm. I hate that statement, but it, it makes sense, you know what I mean? I'm mm -hmm. living my, 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 my truth. I'm standing in I hate those things. They just they sound too hippy dippy trippy. Let's burn some incense and come on everybody, shine on you know, it's and that's not who I am. But when it fits, when it fits and it does. So there you go. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Uh, apparently, he, uh, according to what I'm right, reading here, in 1982, Johnny Mathis inadvertently revealed his homosexuality during what he thought was an off-the-record interview. Oh, right. Yes. And then, yes, I remember reading about that. But then he sort of kept it hidden again for decades after, and then finally, fully. And, and then he confirmed he was gay in 2017. There you go. See. Yep. I, I come from San Francisco. That. It's not unusual to be gay in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, people did have to stay in the closet. Uh, I remember, um, well, Rupert, oh, what's his name? Oh, he started with Madonna. Rupert, Rupert, Rupert Everett. Everett. People were thinking he would be the next James Bond. Yeah, and he said, no, he couldn't be because of that. And I'm like, yeah, you're an actor. I think he could have been. I think he could. I don't know if he was ever actually enough. offered it, or if it was just uh, no, he turned wanted it down. to be the next. Oh, he was offered. Yeah. Oh no, no, no. He 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 wasn't offered it per se. Uh, the the it was floating about that the offer was on the table, and he's like, no one would ever accept an out gay man as Bond. And I was kind of like, yeah, I don't. I, I think a lot of people wouldn't, but myself, I'm like, you're an actor. Act straight. I think he can do that. I'm pretty sure most gay men have acted straight at some point in their lives. I think he's probably got more experience with with that than, than a lot of people do. So yeah, I think he could do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking that he thought that nobody would buy it. That, and that was his thing. He, he was said, ahead of I, the time. He yes, he didn't think anybody would buy it. And and I, I think he would have been a great James Bond, personally. Daniel Craig mm -hmm. did set a new bar. I was yep. re-watching uh, Tomorrow Never Dies the other night because, well, Michelle Yao. Hmm. of course Pierce and Michelle and I watched it and I'm like there was things that there was there's was elements of the story that were oddly uh, translated well to today and other elements where it's like oh boy that's I remember watching the theater and I go this is the best bond ever and now I look back and go, well there's a cheesy element to it today whereas none of the Daniel Craig films ever had a cheesy element whatsoever mm -hmm. they were all and and they were inspired by the boring series of films where it had to be visceral violent uh, prominent in your face, no cheekiness there. There were you know cheeky elements like where he 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 walks off a crane that he just just used to destroy uh, half a train to get onto the next car. And he jumps off and immediately fixes his cufflinks, right? <laughs> Which right. that was about as cheeky as it ever got. There we go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, just to finish up some stuff uh, about uh, some of the the budgets, uh, Alberta's budget. I uh, jump. Okay, even though they are declaring a two point five billion dollars surplus, um, 
it is only a quarter of the previous year's surplus because the price of oil has dropped in the meantime. Now, of course, the Minister of Finance, when he was presenting this, uh, was blowing some sunshine up the collective butts of all Albertans, basically trying to frame the surplus, uh, the entirety of it, as being due solely and uniquely to their hard work and resilience, and not because the price of oil happens to be up because some dickhead across the pond decided to start a war. I'm not saying that Albertans are not hard workers. Of course they're hard workers. I mean, Canadians are hard workers, period. I mean, have you seen this country? <laughs> it takes a lot to keep it going, especially considering the size and the distance and the extreme weather and everything. Canadians work hard. That's not that's not up for debate. Um, but, you know, oil goes up, oil goes down. When you suddenly have like a huge surplus coming in, one, because of pent up demand and economic activity and because a price of a resource happens to be up at the moment. Um, you know, it's like hard work counts for all, counts for, counts for some of it, but it certainly doesn't count for all of it. You know, there's a little luck here involved. You know, you happen to have been sitting on oil while it was up. So, uh, but it's a budget with record spending um, and, you know, chicken in every pot type thing. And uh, yeah, I guess they're going to attempt uh, to use the budget as a bit of seduction and hope that it works. So we'll see how that goes. Um, Rachel Notley uh, was not impressed <laughs> <laughs> with the budget at all, uh, basically calling it a typical uh, vote buying scheme. She said, frankly, this is just a deeply dishonest vote buying effort by the UCP. Here today, gone tomorrow. That's why Daniel Smith's first budget must also be her last one. Um, I can think of many, many, many other reasons for which this <laughs> must be Daniel Smith's last budget. Uh, and um, it has nothing to do with her ability to manage a budget. She gotta go. <clears throat> She's very, very, very special. Uh, and uh, the British Columbia government also presented its budget. I don't really have much details other than they are projecting an $11 billion deficit. I don't know if that's better or not as good as the year before. So like I said, I'll need a bit of time uh, to get uh, a little more uh, of a deeper dive and uh, find out some stuff for you and bring you uh, more as it comes out. Uh, however, uh, I'm assuming that a lot of provinces are going to be coming out with their budgets uh, and territories in the next little while, and uh, there might just be a... <laughs> we do have 13 of them and then a federal one, so that might just be a, a too much work for one beaver. <laughs> but I will do my best. Um, and uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's move on from, uh, oh, and there was a little bit of economic news uh, that we had uh, no growth in the fourth quarter. Uh, there was actually a bit of contraction for the month of December, which was the first contraction we've had since the Omicron wave hit. Um, because the job numbers have been so good, some uh, economists are predicting that uh, we might get a little bit of an uptick in January uh, for January numbers when they come out. Um, We'll see about that. Uh, but so far, technically, we are still officially not in a recession, which is kind of interesting, to be totally honest, uh, because I suspected at some point we would take a dip. Now, right now, they're saying that if we do, it will probably just be shallow and will be quick. But um, kits from my experience, uh, that's what they said <laughs> about inflation, that it would not be uh, long running and wouldn't go very high. And then when we had <clears throat> the economic crash in 2008, they said we would rebound by a certain time. And it took another like year or two after that <laughs> to fully do that. Uh, so um, I'm starting to think after close to 50 years on the planet that, uh, oh yes, there's a coming recession, but it will be uh, shallow and will be quick is standard operating procedure that people say in every instance so that people don't start to panic and hoard and do stuff like that, that can also help drive up the cost and price of stuff. Um, 
because it's very the only time in my lifetime that I remember it being true is when we had when uh, Prime Minister Harper gave us a second recession right out of 2008 uh, by having cutting. Uh, basically promised funding and then telling all the departments after you had gotten all the PR benefit, like, uh, if you don't have to spend that, like, don't. And then, oh, look, we've got a great surplus. Uh, problem is that created a huge deficit in all those programs because they were expecting that money. Uh, so when Prime Minister Trudeau came into office, when he was saying, you know, we're going to be running deficits, that's one of the reasons for which we were running deficits, because even though Stephen Harper... Uh, very duplicitously and um, for the sake of doing what I call window dressing politics, uh, sold the GR, GM shares uh, that we had accumulated as a nation by helping them with the bailout during the 2008 crash. And he sold them at a loss in order to be able to get a couple of billion dollars that he was missing to say that he had a balanced budget. So when the conservatives keep on saying, we left the liberals with a balanced budget, no, they really didn't. They left us with a structural deficit, which they masked by selling a national asset at fire shell prices for a one-time quick infusion of cash to bring the budget to balance that one time. That's how they did it. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, that bailout was BS definitely on because, you know, like I keep on saying, right. When every, when people say that the government should run their budgets like a household or run it like a business, first of all, the government is not a business and it's also not a household, right. It's not also just a human, right. We each have, we're, we're planning, you know, for 65 and retirement age and we put money aside and we plan for that and we know we're going to live a certain amount of time. We have an average life expectancy if we're lucky and, you know, we have a good life and things are well and we have good health and we live longer than that. And some of us live, you know, don't, some of us stay, stay start saving for retirement when we're young and we never get there, right? It's, uh, you know, the world's a bit of a random place a bit <laughs> in that way. So, you know, a nation has the benefit of a much longer timeline, right? They could have held those shares for 30, 40 years if that's what it took for the company to become profitable again. And if it didn't ever become profitable again, they, you know, the shares went down to zero eventually. Well, you can write it off because it's X number of billion and a, you know, a budget of trillions. So, you know, it's, <sighs> you can dilute it. There was no need. There was no need. And it was basically a two-step contribution. If you're giving somebody some money and they say, we're going to give you this instead. And then, you know, you sell it at a loss. Well then why even take the shares? Right. It was just, again, action for action's sake, a visual. We took the shares to create the impression among the Canadians that they were getting an asset that would have value and that we would at least break even by holding that asset until that time or maybe doing a slight profit down the road and we gave them the money and then we sold the asset at a loss that was the conservative way but they say they're good with money <laughs> just saying man <laughs> it's it, it's 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 a sketchy process it's a sketchy process so um yeah so enough about money for now, enough about money. Let's talk about a couple of other things here. Um, yesterday, of course, was the last day of Black History Month. Did not mention that, uh, even though we did talk a little bit about Black History Month in, uh, in passing, uh, but just wanted to, to mention it. Um, and uh, with regard to what's been going on with, uh, how would I say, the Chinese election interference thing. Um, we're hearing from the government side, and uh, Minister Marco Mendocino uh, once again came out yesterday to say, Canadians and Canadians alone determine the outcomes of our elections by voting at the ballot box. And while that is true, because we have one of the best electoral systems in the entire world, and because we do paper ballots, it's not like somebody could come in and change the results. I mean, the only way to affect a, you know, a vote, technically, is if you're affecting one-on-one -on -one the voter and you have to affect one-on-one -on -one each voter and get them to turn that makes it harder work so canadian elections the way that they are structured the way they are made the way they are run are very difficult to skew in that sense but the problem is 
and I'm sorry, but I have to call out the bullshit on the, on the liberal government on this one. The problem is, is that nobody is saying that the problem was at the ballot box. That's not what the reports are saying. The reports are saying that these happened at nomination pro, at the nomination stages. At least that is the case for Handong, the one and the only one of those who allegedly received a benefit that people think might have been in on it or amenable to giving China into something back in exchange for that. Um, now, the prime minister uh, came out and said that uh, Mr. Dong is an outstanding member of our team and suggestions he is somehow not loyal to Canada should not be entertained. It is not up to unelected security officials to, detect political, to dictate to political parties who can or cannot run. That's a really important principle. We, of course, draw upon the expertise every step of the way, but the suggestions in the media that CSIS would somehow say, no, this person can't run, or no, that person can't run, is not just false. It is damaging to people's confidence in our democratic and political institutions. And that is 100% true. That is absolutely 100% true. There's not a word of lie in that one. But... This is also not the point. I mean, the conservatives are trying to spin it. Like, CSIS came out to say, well, we got information about this guy. This is the information we have about this guy. We're telling you all the information we know about this guy, and this guy should not run. That's not how it happens. CSIS says, we have some information that there might be some activity going on surrounding whichever. Maybe they don't even say which candidates. Right. To say, we've noticed some activity. We, know, we don't know how much. And again, because a lot of this is information that will never see the light of day, because if you do it, you could be revealing sources, methods, contacts, assets. Right? I understand the prime minister's in a tough spot, but you have to say something other than, you know, only Canadians voted, because that's not where the problem is. That's not mm -hmm. the thing you need to address. Right? You need to address the security of your nomination processes. You need to address you know, the fact that, yes, because we have this little thing called internet and everybody's connected with a series of tubes, anyone anywhere can try to influence, influence an election. <clears throat> right? And you don't need a lot of money. Right? No. $25,000, you want to give $2,000 to, to each person, you've got 12 people. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's... This is not, it, it's not a, it's not an enterprise that requires like millions and millions of dollars and, you know, and people with advanced degrees and like this can very easily be something that nobody in the country would know about except the few people that the Communist Party of China selected here to act as point people to sort of reach out. And like, there's like nobody like knocking on the door and say, hey, candidate from the Liberal Party, I'm from the Communist Party of of China. We would like to donate $3,000 to your campaign if you would like advocate these policies on our behalf. Are you okay with that? Let's shake on it. <laughs> it's like, it's not how it happens, right? It's be somebody coming in like this and like beating the MP and talking about stuff and say, okay, you know, he seems to agree on certain things. Okay, let's cozy up. Let's have, you know, let's make a political donation. The MP doesn't even have to be in on it. He mm -hmm. seems like he agrees with certain policies, you know, let's give him a little donation, see what happens like this. You know, out of all the people that are in the nomination race, he seems the one to be the one like this. So let's pump a little money there. Person doesn't even have to know about it. I mean, this is not right there's a lot of blanks i keep on saying to you kids right it's like what are the things that we actually do know right what are the things that are actually in the report what are the things that we actually do know and we still haven't seen the report right because all of these are leaked all of these are leaked so based on what they can show we know very little and there's a lot of people with a vested interest of filling in the blanks with what they want, need, wish to be true for their narrative to spin. Because when you hear the conservatives tell this, only liberals got the benefit. And then when you mention, uh, well, no, there were some conservatives that got the benefit. Well, that's why we want to release all of the names, is what they say. They don't. They don't. 
<laughs> it's just what they say to get through the current nanosecond. Um, so uh, this is, but the prime minister stuck out his neck when he said that about Handong. So he had better be right. Yeah. That they tried true. and that there was no way that he could be corrupted. And I mean, and this is a question of, you know, how well do you think you know someone? Right. When he appointed Jody Wilson Raybould to be the first indigenous woman minister of justice, when he appointed Julie Payette to the role of governor general, you know, on paper, they well, were and there's only so much vetting you can do, right? Right. So, you know, I'm really, 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 really hoping because if the prime minister uh, gave his full throated endorsement in this way, and turns out that we do find that one is not going to go over well. No, and there's no all. coming back from that. No, there's no, no coming back, back from, from that from one. That. Yeah. So he had better, I hope, that the internal team did all the due diligence like this to find out at the time if they had gotten a warning specifically about him to right. find out if that was the case. Uh, or else that's this. This could be a time release. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It, it's uh, just, it, it's weird timing, don't you think? Well, yes, it is weird timing. And you know what? Uh, I am glad that you actually mentioned that. <laughs> because, um, well, Let's put it this way. This news came out at a specific time. The news mm -hmm. is coming out through leaks. We mm -hmm. do not know who. No. We do know that by virtue of the fact that we have the ENSICOP committee, right? That committee of all parliamentarians from all parties that get uh, briefed on this national intelligence and national security stuff. We're not allowed to say anything, but do get the information. We do know that there are conservatives on that committee. So we do know that the Conservative Party of Canada does have the information in their possession, and therefore it can be a source of the leak. And um, Mr. Grizzly, um, if you would, um, do you know who the conservative candidate in the writing of Don Valley North. That is now yeah. the seat of which is now mm -hmm. occupied by Mr. Hangdong. Do you happen to know who was his conservative opponent in that race? Yeah, she was the but if you would the put head up the, uh, of the convoy. The, well, it's, yes. it's gone. You'll have to bring it up again. She was the head cheerleader of the convoy. She's on video uh, tooting a horn. Yes. This lady, Sarah Fisher, who recently became very conveniently the director of communications of the Conservative Party of Canada. Mm. What are the odds <clears throat> that the director of communications who lost the election and like by a good amount, I think he got some like 10,000 votes, she got 6,000 something. So was close, yeah, there's a, and I'm, yeah. I, and I doubt very much that the government of China <laughs> happened to find four thousand something Canadian electors willing to do its bidding in one riding to turn it over, right? So, um, as we mentioned, when those uh, those people on the 2019 uh, panel that was reviewing stuff, right? You know, yes, there's election interference that happens. I mean, you know, you know, we should be insulted if it didn't. We are a G7. <laughs> there are attempts at it, but you know, nothing happened at a national or at a writing level. And the committee had the authority to act both at the national and at the writing level if there was going to be something. So there is nothing. Okay, but this lady. Sarah Fisher, well, I mean, as a communications advisor, you know, you have access to a lot of stuff. As a director of communications, you have access to a whole lot of other stuff and connections. And whatnot. So Sarah and Conservative Party of Canada, I am not saying that you are the source of the leak and that you did that. 
because I have no information on which to base that. But I am saying that it is impossible to rule you out as that source of the leak based on the information that we know. And this, as the church lady would say, my, how convenient that she's the one that happens to be having access to all the communication apparatus of the party. And the person being singled out for special treatment at the moment, it just happens to be her rival candidate in the last previous election. <laughs> in the previous election. Uh, uh, there may be nothing there. Maybe nothing there, but mm, it don't look good. And when you're a director of communications, you're supposed to do everything to avoid even the semblance of things that don't look good. So she's not mm -hmm. very good at her job. <laughs> not very good at her job at all. All at all at all at all. Uh, so yeah, I would um, keep your eyes peeled just in case. There, uh, see how hard they try to push this thing, um, because if they decide right right now, everybody's looking for channel changers. Even the federal government, like the the announcement that they're removing TikTok from government equipment and the Quebec government announced uh, after that they're doing it provincially as well. That too is an action for action's sake, right? You know, Chinese interference. Okay. We need to be something doing some, do you seem to be doing something right. to get tough on China? Okay. We're banning TikTok from government applications. Probably a good idea to begin with. <laughs> and uh, Jagmeet Singh, who's a prolific TikTok user did say that he would mm -hmm. comply and uh, that the party would use this time to evaluate what the real impact is. They're not going to do that. They don't have the ability to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's, there's no they, way they could. They have no budget. <laughs> Clearly. I have to jump out for a few minutes, but I'll be back shortly. All right. There you go. Um, so I was uh, going to put up some uh, video images, <laughs> but he just <laughs> zipped out on me. So that's okay. That's okay because we have other stuff uh, for you. Let me just look through my notes over here. Uh, what do we have? So with regard to TikTok, the prime minister said, we're making the decision that for government employees, for government equipment, it is better to not have them access TikTok because of the concerns that people have in terms of safety. Uh, so as of yesterday, the video sharing application TikTok was removed from all government equipment. Uh, following a review of TikTok, the Chief Information Officer of Canada determined that it presents an unacceptable level of risk to privacy and security. The decision to remove and block TikTok from government mobile devices is being taken as a precaution, particularly given concerns about the legal regime that governs the information collected from mobile devices and is in line with the approach of our international partners, said the President of the Treasury Board, Mona Fortier. Now, uh, as I mentioned, Mr. Singh said that he would comply with it, and I believe there were about uh, eight uh, NDP MPs and four conservative MPs that had TikTok accounts. Uh, interestingly, no liberal MPs have a TikTok account. So what did the liberals know that the other parties did not know? We don't know. <laughs> but that could be a talking point for them should things uh, pan out at some point should there be some bad news about tiktok well then liberals could go well we were never on it because we always knew or something right so that could be just again keep your eyes peeled in case something that opportunity comes up uh, somebody certainly planned for it if there's a good communications person there they've planned for that um they are concerned about uh, data security and potential. They had some potential cybersecurity concerns resulting from the fact that uh, TikTok is a Beijing based company and therefore it is assumed to have a connection with China's Communist Party, particularly with regard to data collection. Um, right? We want to be careful where, who, whose hands all that data is. Um, the United States and two bodies of uh, the European Union have previously done the same, and about 50% of uh, the states in the United States have also done that. Uh, the TikTok uh, social media platform reaches about a billion users uh, worldwide. So, yeah, it's a, and it's a, 
there seems to be a consensus uh, growing among uh, Western allied nations uh, that this is the way to go. So we'll see how that uh, manifests itself uh, as it continues. But uh, these are um, on the the international st- uh, scene. These are all um, little moments of a rolled up paper and bopping China on the nose with it. Um, something China really, 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 really does not like. So uh, we'll see what type of retaliation uh, there will be because a standard China line is that, uh, you know, there will be some type of retaliation when, whenever we take a stand. So anyway, we'll see what happens, but this is clearly not over. And uh, let's just say the relationship relations are not getting better. Relations are not getting better. So, uh, <sighs> For those of us who are who are with it, we uh, a lot of people are saying we're probably in a, entering or in already a another Cold War. So, like we need more stress and tension, right? Oh well. <laughs> um, interesting thing happened in the United States. Uh, if you are paying attention, uh, Dominion Voting Services has launched a couple of defamation suits, particularly against the U.S. right-wing news networks like OAN and uh, Fox News, and uh, there's another one, that uh, Newsmax. Um, during the previous election, um, one of the interesting that things that happened on the media scene in the United States is that there started to be competition on the right for 24 hour news. Um, for the people who thought that Fox news wasn't extreme enough for them. Uh, so you had OAN, you had Newsmax, um, come up and, um, one of the things that you could always say about Fox is that their actual news division was actual actually a news division, but what ended up having at Fox is because the opinion section, which is most of the evening program and late afternoon programming, um, was so popular that there started being wars between both sections, uh, both divisions at Fox. So the opinion reporters were saying that the election was stolen and all that kind of stuff. And then the news reporters on Fox were saying that that wasn't the case. And then the opinion people would go on their shows uh, in the evening and start attacking the people from the news division at Fox, (laughs) not just CNN or MSNBC, but at Fox for stating that what they were saying on their evening shows was not true, but you know, there's not a, the people tune in for the evening shows on Fox. (laughs) So, you know, for whatever good that did on the network (laughs) to have some reporters, it was, you know, at best it was serving as a fig leaf of plausible deniability for Fox in the overall, in the overall media ecosystem saying, well, no, 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 we're not like that. See, we actually have a news division. We actually have it like once or twice a day, you know, on our network that it's not true. Of course we, you know, that the election was stolen. Of course we say, 500 times a day on the network that the election was stolen, but two times a day, we have some news people that tell us that it's not. So no, no, we actually are a fair and balanced news organization. And we actually do news the, the right way. <laughs> so there was infighting at Fox going on between there. And, uh, this defamation suit is basically, um, from Dominion Voting Systems, and I think there's another uh, company as well that is doing this. Uh, basically, they're saying that they destroyed their business you know, by saying that their machines were corruptible and that they would be willing to, you know, participate in schemes to allow that to happen, to allow, um, you know, Chavez in Venezuela, who's been dead for I don't know how long now, uh, to rig the voting machines somehow and, you know, connect them to Jewish space lasers, I guess. So I don't know whatever. Uh, yeah. (laughs) So Dominion voting systems is suing Fox for $1.6 billion. And they're suing OAN and Newsmax for similar amounts. And during the deposition, Rupert Murdoch, that dehydrated husk of an Australian man, uh, admitted on the record that Fox News horse hosts horses, yeah. <laughs> that Fox News hosts endorsed 
false stolen election claims. But he did not agree that Fox News as a whole, as an entity, promoted the lies. But, quote, some of our commenter- commenters were endorse- endorsing it. Now, he says that he thinks that the claims of the election being stolen are BS and are damaging. Um, and documents that were released uh, basically stated that a lot of the hosts at Fox thought the same thing because their emails and communications with each other were shared. And um, they don't make the hosts look good. (laughs) (laughs) Now, if you are someone in the United States who have lost uh, some of their family members to this type of thing, and um, you bring this information you show them like, you know, on the news, they said that, you know, Donald Trump was there like this, but here's like Sean Hannity talking to his colleagues saying like, nah, he doesn't believe this. And this is a bad thing that they're doing. Um, for some people that might create the instant cognitive dissonance. Well, how do you explain this? That might jolt them. Uh, but some of them are so far gone that even that won't, you know, seeing their actual words and how they communicate with each other on their free time when the cameras are not on and what they're saying to each other might not be enough. Um, so, but there are cracks in the mirror for people who are looking at it. And eventually, if this gets, some people will be able to be brought back. Not not everyone. Some people will just move on to the next thing because they're just looking for a reason to believe or to follow. Um, But there's pretty much no doubt based on the documents that were submitted uh, in evidence detailing the communications that people at the Fox News Network had between them um, that they didn't believe it and that they were putting this information that they did not believe to be true on air and quite possibly uh, doing it for the money because there were discussions among them about losing viewer share to OAN and to Newsmax, in part because the orange shit stain was all over the media saying that Fox News had basically abandoned them because they had called Arizona first and they did not call it for Trump. It was the news media, the news division did that and and their political bureau desk, which is one of the better ones in the old, all of the United States and all the media. Uh, they invest a lot of money into their election bureau desk and making sure that they get it right. Now what they tell us <laughs> is one thing, but they make sure that they get it right for their own things. So their division is actually, actually really, really good, uh, which is actually ox- counterintuitive, you would think, for Fox, but it actually is legitimately very good. Uh, so when they called Arizona first while everybody was losing their minds and saying it can't be true, I was sitting here at home and I was like, yeah, it's true. And the Fox went out and said it first and went out and put its, uh, <laughs> its neck on the line for it. Uh, I doubt very much that that's going to be turned over because of just how good their decision desk is. So, uh, but that did not make orange shit staying happy. And he drove a lot of viewership to those other two networks. Yeah, and it's not like, you know, it's not like 50 million people left Fox and like their share, but, you know, you lose one or two points because these are fledgling networks that had nothing, nothing. They just like Mm -hmm. popped up. And then all of a sudden, whoa, okay. Suddenly you were getting like 500,000 viewers and suddenly now you're getting two, two million, three million all of a sudden over a quick short period of time it's because yeah the the people that are have the line going from the fox tv screen right into their vein they weren't getting their high well one of the things i've always found weirdly um i don't know if the term ironic fits here or not but some one of the things i always found weird about oan and newsmax was the amount of people were going 
Oh, yeah, I've been in Fox. They're not telling the truth. And CNN and mainstream lies, blah, blah, blah. You need OAN or Newsmax. They, they tell the real stories. No, they, they tell stories that fit your narrative that you agree with. It's a gigantic bias confirmation echo chamber. Nothing That's more. It. That's it. That's all it is. I don't like what the news is telling me. It does not confirm with what I want, wish, or need to be true. So let me find a network that will tell me. You're not choosing you know, to be informed. You're, you're, you're going for your next hit. You need to get the political fentanyl right there. That's all it is. That's all it is. And like with all all, all pushers, the first, first taste is free. Well, you remember when OAN and, and Newsmax were in, in uh, press conferences in the White House, uh, Trump would go to yeah. them, oh, OAN, I like you. I like what you have to say. That, there's your tell right there. I like what you have to say. Yes. The leader of your they're nation looking what a certain media network has to say and then calling on them, red flag. Yeah, that's... The relationship that's, is supposed uh, to be adversarial. Yep. Right? The job of the media is to ask popular people unpopular questions. It's it's The person being you know, asked the questions is not supposed to like the questions. That's how it works. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they, can be, they can be courteous. They can be polite. But adversarial is is the job. That's the job. You have information you don't want to share. We have information that we want to get out of you. That's adversarial. (laughs) You have information that you do want to share and want us to carry like this. And you're probably not all the time because sometimes you do have good information that needs to be shared. Right. I mean, not everything's not everything's a moment of duplicity because, but when there's something going on and media is like digging scratching mm-hmm. <laughs> i guess and you don't want the thing that they're scratching to find out to be revealed that's an adversarial relationship when you want to talk about something else so you don't want to tell, so you don't talk about the thing that's being scratched at <laughs> right <laughs> that's an adversarial relationship <laughs> it's the way that it goes so i mean like come on when a politician is complaining about the questions that they're getting, mm-hmm. come on. Well, it, and we can we can wind the clock back to 1980 when, when Reagan became the president and he summarily erased the fairness doctrine along mm-hmm. with what was the other what was the other bill that was tabled back in the 40s or it might have even been earlier than that where uh, broadcast media companies had to have one hour a day of news. Uh, and they weren't allowed to advertise during that time period, actually. It had to be inform the people, be truthful. We're not going to like everything you have to say, but this is how it has to be done. And he wiped that out. That was how Fox News was created. That's That was how OAN and Newsmax came to be under his wiping out of the fairness doctrine. So then it became a ratings juggernaut. And I'm like, wait a minute. News shouldn't, ratings shouldn't count. Because they're not, they weren't supposed to advertise during the news. That was all tossed out. All mm-hmm. because of what is it, my friends? The almighty money. <laughs> filthy <laughs> lucre. Filthy lucre. Um, speaking of a filthy lucre, uh, Mr. Grizzly, if you would, I would. Colin Carey. One of the people mm. that went to Nazi brunch. John Iveson, mm. we mentioned about him, right? Like this mm. running the water, helping with the counter programming. We simply can't trust Trudeau's word on China's electoral infer- interference. Well, you're going to have to because there's nobody else's word that you can get on this. So Colin Carey retweets that. Where there's smoke. Are you fucking Pot? kidding me right now? Pot, may I introduce you to the kettle? He says he owned his mistake. He says he will do better. And the very next day, he comes out with, well, next year, maybe two days, it comes out. He dined with a fucking Nazi. Mm-hmm. Where there's smoke. Yeah. He's literally on mm-hmm. fire. Where there's, perhaps sit this one out, shit stain. 
Holy, yeah. shameless, shameless, mind bogglingly, stupidly shameless. Agreed. It is the basic price of entry. To be a conservative, you must be absolutely shameless and act like you have zero self awareness. If if you literally were oh, sorry gonna con. and owned a mistake, like this, you would like go away for a few weeks, be quiet, maybe think about what mm-hmm. you did. You wouldn't be coming back like two days later trying to swing at the guy you had no dinner with a Nazi in order to remove. <sighs> What the? Okay, I understand that the media cycle moves fast, but it don't move that fast, honey. We still remember mm. who you are, motherfucker. <laughs> we haven't forgotten you. <laughs> what the? <laughs> I. <laughs> the things these people do. Seriously. I d- uh, mm-hmm. pushes my button, kids. It pushes my button, making me slap my tail against the water. <laughs> I am not a happy beaver when I see people pulling stupid crap like that. That is just uh <laughs> How how do how do you sleep at night? How do you look in the mirror? How do you, how, how, how can you be so, con- the only way I can imagine someone doing this is because they've m- managed somehow to convince themselves that they are so right, that they are the only one that holds truth. They're the only one who see the truth and everyone else is wrong. And they're on this righteous, and that they've so do, that's the only because this just done this you're putting all the when you put all the elements together this is something that should not be able to walk and breathe and talk at the same time the pieces don't fit together but they're trying to make them fit and it's just mm-hmm. <sighs> wow yeah it's um you know it's like to observe them in their natural environment doing like like if this was like a wild nature show like, doo, 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 doo. and there you see a conservative in their natural environment watch them <laughs> the knife in the back of the person that just fed them <laughs> oh. the mating dance <laughs> Shouldn't that be the sound of a cash register? Sting. <laughs> and the sound of a dog whistle in the distance. <laughs> I just like, Anglo-Saxon terms. <laughs> oh, holy crap, man. Holy crap. These people, I swear they wear out my Oh, way. yeah. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Christ, man! Uh, they really do think we're still. That, that's why the thing with the prime minister the other day says conservatives have to stop taking can- Canadians for fools. And I don't know if like I was on screen, but like I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> while that was going on. Because I mean, it's just how do you keep on insulting people's intel? I mean, they are literally. Look at you straight in the face. Yeah, we think you're that dumb. You know how dumb mm-hmm. we are? Like this? Mm-hmm. We think that you're so dumb that I'm just going to put out a tweet after I dined with the Nazi about Trudeau saying, where there's no <laughs> like this. And I'm going to expect you to buy that and be outraged. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Not outraged by my shamelessness. Not outraged, not outraged by the fact that I'm a 24-7 you know, party person. That's feeding the 24 7, 365 rage hate machine that my party. No, that's. I, Stokes I the fire. That, that's not the stuff I want to stick in your craw. I want you to think where there's smoke, there's fire because of. Uh, uh. 
again, you dined with a Nazi. I just, I. Yeah. There's no card in yeah, the that's... deck. <laughs> There's no card in the deck. <laughs> that trumps that. You dined with a Nazi. It's all there is to it. You you opened with the highest trump card. There's nothing in the deck that beats it. <laughs> mm. it's, uh, uh. And that's why I eat cookies and chocolate kids. It makes me forget the pain. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, so in this whole election thing, uh, the report from the 2021 panel finally came out uh, because yesterday we were talking about the report of the 2019 panel and we do have to wrap up soon. So um, just the thing that's going on right now is that this report uh, was written by a guy named Morris Rosenberg. And before it even came out, the conservatives were trying to dismiss it because Morris Rosenberg once for a period of four years between 2014 and 2018 served as the chief executive officer of the Trudeau Foundation, the Pierre mm -hmm. Elliott Trudeau Foundation. Correct. Um, so he served for four years like this, so therefore he is tainted. Everything else about him as a human being, about his career, about who he is, about his values, whatnot, doesn't matter. He served four years, therefore he is in the pocket. That's it. Boom. And this foundation apparently got a, or was working, they found out in the CSIS thing that China was working in 2014, looking to give about a million dollar donation to the Trudeau Foundation. Okay. Number one. Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau, for anybody who knows history, was one of the first Western leaders to recognize China around 1970. So mm -hmm. the government of China, long memory, respecting your elders, tradition, all that kind of stuff, does have an affection for Pierre Elliott Trudeau at the time. It is completely unsurprising to me that if the son of the first prime minister of Canada and one of the first Western leaders to have ever recognized China suddenly becomes the leader of a political party and therefore an option to become prime minister, that suddenly there would be renewed interest in the foundation. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the way that China wanted to make the payments, have someone else make the payment and they refund them is very, very, very sus. <laughs> <laughs> not, 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 not really above board, um, but right. So working for the foundation is not a thing, right? Not a thing. And they're basically saying that, so they're throwing him under the bus. Well, here's the thing. This guy, Morris Rosenberg is a 34 year lifelong public servant who was a deputy minister three times, twice in Stephen Harper's government. Mm -hmm. He was John Baird's deputy minister. John Baird was the only person Stephen Harper trusted to be alone with his wife and to make some comments to the press without first clearing it with him. This is true. He threw a fellow conservative right under the bus shamelessly. Because he doesn't care. He doesn't care. Does not care. This is the person that you're dealing with, kids. Eyes wide open. Yep. So don't buy the thing that the report's all corrupted because he's like, they turn around. This is a guy that worked for the conservatives. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> all right, kids. I think we have a show. We hope that you enjoyed it because we love making it for you. We do, we do, we do, we do. If uh, you, we have to do the exit a little quick, so we're going to speed through it. Um, if you want to communicate with us, True Eager on Twitter, True North Eager Beaver at Gmail. Uh, you can leave comment on our YouTube uh, channel, or you can uh, go to our Facebook, at True North Eager Beaver on Facebook. If you want to leave us a tip where Mr. Grizzly's pointing, that brings us to our coffee page, ko-fi.com slash eagerbeaver.com 
all in one word. Or if you want to get us some merch down there, the QR code, uh, that's just how that little shiny thing going there. You go to our Crier Media store. Uh, I believe that is Crier dot co slash crier hyphen media hyphen shop and you can get yourself some uh merch over there please smash all the buttons subscribe like tell your friends share retweet all that kind of stuff uh until next time dear kids it can be a tough world out there so be kind to and gentle with yourself and give us our wisdom mr grizzly uh, 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 uh. Be nice. Be kind. Forget your troubles. Come on, get happy. Happy Wednesday. <laughs> Gonna take all your cares. Uh, I ain't got much. It's <laughs> preoccupied, you know. All right. No wisdom today. Make your own. <laughs> For all the credits, Mr. Grizzly. <laughs> You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community and forum, and the Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from fresh farm ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Go out there and have yourselves a beaverific Wednesday, kids. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Bye. Woohoo!